Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement, as we go in search of history. November 26th, 1922, in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Archaeologist Howard Carter cautiously opens the sealed doorway of a newly discovered tomb. Inside, candlelight reveals the most incredible archaeological find ever. His amazing discovery will resurrect a long-forgotten king, Tutankhamun, drawing him unrelentingly into the 20th century and reawakening the magic and the mysticism of an ancient civilization. Join us as we go in search of history to examine the mysteries of King Tut. From the earliest days of their ancient civilization, Egyptians lived close to the land. With each change of seasons, with each setting and rising of the sun, they witnessed the continuing cycle of life, death, and rebirth playing out in the world around them. With such undeniable proof of the universe's ability to recharge itself, these deeply spiritual people embraced the belief that they too would be reborn after death. The cult of the dead became the obsession of the living, defining all aspects of Egyptian society. Religion created this civilization. Then the Egyptians created science to serve the afterlife. We create science to serve our daily life. This is different. And this is why you can see building the pyramid, astronomy, art, science, all of that were designed by the Egyptians to serve religion, to serve the afterlife. Egyptians believed that the heart of the deceased was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, the goddess of truth. The swallowing monster quickly destroyed the spirit with a heavy heart, but if the scales balanced, the soul was free to roam the earth. Instead of imagining their spirit or soul or whatever as going off after death to some paradise, the Egyptians imagined themselves living in this world, but in a spiritual form, which means that they're no longer subject to any of the hardships that are associated with a physical body. Excessive heat, cold, disease, hunger, whatever. The Egyptian tomb provided the spirit, or ka, of the deceased with a resting place each night, as well as a place to store the necessities for survival in this netherworld. Its contents reflected the position and wealth of its owner, and no expense was spared in outfitting it for the hereafter. The Egyptians did not care about their houses. They would live in a house for 40, for 50 years, but he would live inside the tomb for thousands of thousands of years. The most magnificent tombs belong to Egypt's storied pharaohs, including the great pyramids of the early dynasty kings. Their architects employed false passageways and secret doors to safeguard the precious contents for eternity. Nonetheless, Enterprising thieves of the time continually managed to break through and plunder the tombs. No pyramid was left untouched. By the 16th century BC, the pharaohs had traded pride for security and began building less conspicuous tombs in a rocky valley outside Thebes. The inhospitable valley was easy to guard an important quality for any royal necropolis. In one of the tombs of Thutmose the I, his architect, Inini, wrote one inscription inside the tomb, and he said, I built the tomb of my majesty. No one see and no one hear. And this to show that the valley was a perfect location for the Egyptians to hide their treasures. 
At least 40 kings and royal family members were buried in splendor in this wasteland called the Valley of the Kings. When the great Egyptian dynasties of the New Kingdom faded into inevitable history, the guards were pulled away. The tombs of the pharaohs were left exposed, and one by one, tomb robbers plundered them all. All that is, except one. It remained hidden for more than 3,000 years, even as a new kind of plunderer entered the scene, the modern archaeologist. In the early 20th century, Egypt was under the control of the British Empire. Foreigners fleeing less hospitable climates set up residence in classic hotels such as the Winter Palace in Luxor or ferried their guests up the Nile on private yachts. During the short winter season, some of the wealthier foreigners dabbled in archaeology, driven by scientific curiosity and acquisitiveness. Everything that was found would be divided in half, with the Egyptian government getting the half that they wanted and the other half going to the excavator. This was a, uh, the reason why so many people tried to excavate in Egypt, the museums and, and uh, wealthy individuals and so forth. But the ultimate and intact tomb of a pharaoh had not yet been found. One man hoped to change that. Howard Carter, the sickly son of an English painter, had first come to Egypt as an artist at the age of 17. He fell in love with the ancient ruins and proved a capable archaeologist despite a difficult personality. He was an outsider in many respects. He was moody. Uh, he did not unburden himself to people he knew. He seemed to have no close friends whatsoever. Um, of either sex. In 1909, the Earl of Carnarvon hired Carter to oversee his concession on the west bank of Thebes, which gave him legal permission to excavate there. An Englishman with a taste for the sporting life, Carnarvon had come to Egypt to recuperate from a debilitating automobile accident and decided to dabble in a little excavation during his recuperation. Carnarvon's easy temperament proved a good match for the serious-minded Carter, and together they unearthed some notable archaeological finds. But through it all, Carter seemed restless. He had one eye over his shoulder all the time at Theodore Davis, uh, working away in the Valley of the Kings. In 1906, American millionaire Theodore Davis had found a small blue-glazed cup in the valley graveyard that bore the name Tutankhamun. The following season, some bundles of embalming powders and vases carrying the same markings were found in a shallow pit. Tutankhamun was a nothing in a way in those days. It was known that there had been a king uh, of that name. Uh, there were a few monuments uh, with his name inscribed on them. And in fact, it was thought that he was perhaps an old man when he came to the throne because he didn't rule very long. The image of an elusive pharaoh haunted Carter. In 1914, at his urging, Lord Carnarvon acquired the Valley of the King's concession. Carter now had legal permission to excavate there, though most knowledgeable archaeologists believed the site was exhausted, that nothing remained to be discovered. But Carter was undeterred. He felt something was waiting for him beneath the rocks and dirt of that historic valley. In the early 20th century, the ravages of World War I put many dreams on hold. British archaeologist Howard Carter was forced to wait until 1917 before he could begin his search for an undiscovered pharaoh's tomb in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Carter set out to methodically explore every corner of the time-ravaged necropolis as hundreds of workers began moving tons of rock and dirt. The valley was full of debris, 
So he worked systematically in different parts of the valley, clearing right down to bedrock, feeling that it was only in this way that he could be sure that there was no other tomb entrance. Even as Carter continued his search, scholars were piecing together clues from excavations all over Egypt, learning more about the mysterious pharaoh Tutankhamun, believed to be buried somewhere in the limestone hills. The time of King Tut was the golden age of Egypt. It was a time when Luxor and Phoebus was the city that controlled the whole world. Then Egypt was rich, and they brought uh, turquoise from Sinai, silver from the east, uh, gold from the south. Tutankhamun was born into this prosperous civilization in the mid-14th century BC, as eddies of turmoil were stirring in the waters of the Nile. The careful diplomacy of King Amenophis III had ensured more than 30 years of uninterrupted peace. But when his iconoclast son, Akhenaten, attained the throne, he abandoned the pantheon of gods his people had venerated for thousands of years to worship only the power of light, the Aten. Infuriating once powerful priests, he closed down the ancient temples in Thebes and moved to a new capital dedicated to his god, the Aten. Most scholars believe Tutankhamun was either the son of the elderly Amenophis III or even the child of Akhenaten himself. Tutankhamun is frustrating because we don't really know who he is. We have one piece of evidence that tells us that he's a king's son of his body. So we know his father was a king, but he never says which king. And this is where great arguments are, arise amongst Egyptologists. The royal prince Tutankhamun was most likely raised among the sparkling new palaces of the new city. His name was then Tutankhaten, which means living image of the Aten. No doubt the young prince grew up believing in the goodness of its rays. He was a child. I mean, you can think about that. Go back to 3,000 years to think what's happened. Maybe he will take wisdom in the palace. I will take lessons from priestess to teach him about future. Akhenaten died or lost power in the 17th year of his reign. Historians argue about who ruled next. They do agree that just a few years later, in about 1333 BC, Tutankhaten was crowned king, although his age remained a mystery. His nation divided between the priests of the old religion and the radical ideas of his father, the new pharaoh must have gazed up at the Aten and pondered an uncertain future. By the spring of 1922, Howard Carter had labored for five long years in the intense desert heat, moving stone after stone with no results. His sponsor, Lord Carnarvon, wanted to abandon the search for a pharaoh's tomb, but Carter begged for one more season. Carter had his eye on just one small area that he had not worked on, but he was interested in. It was an area in front of the tomb of King Ramesses VI. It happened to lie on the route that visitors took coming into the valley, and therefore it was a difficult place to excavate. On November 1st, 1922, the archaeologist opened his final season in the Valley of the Kings. His workers were in good spirits. Carter had purchased a canary to brighten up the home he had built just outside the valley. His workers called it the Golden Bird. They were certain it was a sign of good fortune. Three days later, Carter headed out toward the dig site just after breakfast. His workmen would already have started 
uh, earlier in the day. And when he came along, there was um, a, a sort of whispering of excitement um, because uh, they had uncovered a step. His workmen cleared away rubble to reveal more steps, which led to a door stamped with the jackal and nine captives, the royal seal of the necropolis. Howard Carter's extraordinary diligence prevailed. He found a royal tomb. But Lord Carnarvon was in England, and Carter had to wait two long weeks for his patron to return. Finally, on November 26, 1922, a small group assembled at the tomb. Clearing away the remaining debris from the entrance, Carter uncovered the seal of Tutankhamun. He also found disturbing evidence that someone had previously tunneled inside. Would they find the funereal equipment intact, or had thieves plundered it long ago? Carter removed um, some of the stones of the blocking uh, at a highish level, and uh, he put the candle in, stuck his head through, and said nothing. And this seemed to go on to the people who were there uh, for an interminable time, probably 30 seconds. The impatient Lord Carnarvon at last asked, what do you see? And Carter uttered these now famous words. Wonderful things. Inside, his candle illuminated the golden treasure of the richest archeological find in history. On that fateful day in November of 1922, archaeologist Howard Carter realized a dream, the discovery of a royal tomb in the Valley of the Kings, which belonged to a then little-known pharaoh, Tutankhamun. As my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold, everywhere the glint of gold. I, I was struck with amazement. The small party managed to squeeze through the opening and carefully wander about the antechamber of the tomb. For Carter, it was the moment of a lifetime. The religious icons and everyday treasures of an ancient king lay at his feet. If you want to be vulgar, you could say he must have been gobsmacked. Um, I think he was dumbfounded. Um, no excavator working in Egypt had ever been faced with such a remarkable collection of material. And of course it was only the beginning of what there was to be seen. Time seemed to have stood still in that small chamber. It was a jumbled mess with disassembled chariots stacked in one corner. Another wall was lined with huge ritual couches. Two life-sized statues, in all likelihood the king, stood facing each other as if sentinels to another age. It was quite clear that thieves had got into the tomb and had done a little bit of rifling, um, that boxes had been hastily repacked by guards, who probably helped themselves to a few things um, uh, on the side. Um, and um, then when the tomb was sealed up again, it, um, it was not entered again for over 3,000 years. The next day, as required, Carter notified the local inspector of antiquities of the discovery. The archaeologists added that he planned to explore no further into the tomb until the antechamber had been carefully emptied. This would have been a remarkable show of willpower, except it wasn't true. Unknown to government officials, the night before, Carter had secretly entered and mapped other chambers of the tomb. Photographs show where he placed a basket and some rushes to hide one of the entrances from the Egyptian authorities. They went into the burial chamber and they were amazed to find a room that was practically filled by um, a shrine with scarcely room 
to walk around it and there were a certain number of ritual objects placed carefully around um, the shrine. In all, there were four chambers in the tomb. Thieves had left the annex in total disarray. In the treasury, a statue of Anubis, the god of the underworld, guarded the chest where the king's mummified internal organs were stored. In the burial chamber, Carter carefully opened the panels of the gilded shrine, only to find a second shrine nested inside. A rope with an intact seal of the pharaoh secured this one. It was proof that robbers had not touched the sarcophagus. The mummy of Tutankhamun was still inside. News of the incredible discovery captured imaginations around the world. A rapt public hungered for any news about King Tut. Hordes of tourists suddenly decided to descend on Egypt, including, of course, many people who knew Carnarvon. Carter and his team of conservationists planned to work only during the cool winter months and cleared the antechamber by February of 1923 before closing down for the season. Each new artifact offered more insight into the shrouded history of Tut's life. Countless ritual statues in the image of the king reflected the face of a young man armed to battle the travails of the afterworld. The objects in the tomb are a mixture of items that were made specifically for burial and then items that he would have used in real life. Things like his sandals that have painted on them uh, images of bound foreigners so that when he's wearing them, he is walking on these enemies. Amid musical instruments and writing supplies were four game boards, evidence of a favorite pastime of many Egyptians. A miniature coffin held a touching remembrance, a lock of gray hair. An inscription identified it as belonging to Queen T, possibly the grandmother of the young king. Many images of Tut and his wife decorate a variety of artifacts. His queen was a younger daughter of Akhenaten and may have even been Tut's own half-sister. There seems to be a compelling warmth between the young couple. He was shown to be in love because if you look at the scene in the throne for himself and his wife, you can see they are wearing one shoe. This is to show they are one person. A stash of bows and arrows lay in another corner, a reminder that foreign wars plagued the young pharaoh who was still known as Tutunk Aten in the early days of his reign. When Tut took the throne in 1333 BC, Egypt was under fire. The powerful Hittites were eating away at her northern borders, and a series of plagues was sweeping through the land. Some believe the new religion worshiping the sun disk was the cause of Egypt's problems. The empire needed a unifying ruler, but many scholars believe the king was too young to be actually running the affairs of state. His principal advisor seems to have been I, an older relative with a powerful influence on the young Tutankhamun. We also know that there was a man called Horemheb who served as Tutankhamun's general, who seems to have been another very powerful man. I think we can guess that these men and perhaps others uh, set about bringing order out of, out of chaos. And I imagine that poor Tutankhamun had very little to say about what was going on. Within a few years, Tut abandoned Akhenaten's new city and began to rebuild the old temples in Thebes. He changed his name to Tutank Amun, signaling the return to favor of the old religion and the worship of hundreds of deities. In the eighth year of his reign, all the bright hopes of Tutankhamun came to an end when the young king passed away. His body was embalmed 
and his funereal goods stacked in his tomb. Tut's old advisor, I, now the new pharaoh, touched the mouth, ears, and eyes of the mummy, opening them for the spirit's use in the afterlife. Finally, the vault was sealed for eternity. More than 3,000 years later, the British archaeologist Howard Carter prepared to open the king's sarcophagus. In early January of 1924, there was a buzz of excitement amid the tourists at the tomb of Tutankhamun. Inside, Howard Carter prepared to empty the burial chamber, daring to disturb the eternal resting place of the young king. In meticulous fashion, the archaeologist and his team carefully peeled away four different burial shrines. Inside stood a huge quartzite sarcophagus. Using a system of ropes and pulleys, Carter slowly raised the lid to reveal a magnificent gilded coffin molded in the likeness of the pharaoh himself. Carter was moving closer to the king's mummy and closer to stirring up, some believed, the anger of Egypt's ancient gods. Some say that on the day Howard Carter first opened Tut's tomb and trespassed on the sacred grounds of a pharaoh, a cobra attacked and killed the archaeologist's golden canary. The cobra was a powerful symbolic image associated with pharaohs. Native workers began to whisper that the spirit of Tutankhamun was not dead. Then, rumors of a frightening inscription on the walls of his tomb began to spread. Death shall come on swift wings to him that toucheth the tomb of the pharaoh. In reality, excavators found no such inscription. But other events would do little to assuage the superstitious. Within six short months of opening the tomb, the Earl of Carnarvon cut open a mosquito bite while shaving. The tiny wound became infected, leaving him dangerously ill. He developed pneumonia and died. Um, now, uh, that was a perfectly natural thing to happen for an elderly man in not very good health. Nevertheless, it is said that at the very moment of the Earl's death, the lights went out in the city of Cairo. At the family estate in England, Carnarvon's terrier sat up and howled, and then promptly died. Had Tutankhamun reached out from the grave to strike at those who would violate his sacred resting place? Soon, the untimely demise of anyone even remotely connected to the tomb was attributed to an ancient curse. Carnarvon's friend, American railroad magnate George J. Gould, contracted a cold when visiting the tomb and subsequently died of pneumonia. Months after an Egyptian prince visited the tomb, his wife murdered him in London's Savoy Hotel. Years later, Carter's secretary, Richard Bethel, died in mysterious circumstances. Shortly thereafter, Bethel's father committed suicide. During the funeral, his hearse accidentally struck and killed an eight-year-old child. These deaths and many others were all blamed on the long reach of the Pharaoh's curse. But in truth, most of those working in the tomb lived long, healthy lives. It was a very slow-moving curse. Got you in the end. Um, but uh, it is, of course, the kind of thing that tickles people's imagination. Uh, you cannot kill the idea of a curse, no matter what I or anyone else says. But then I have no imagination. Zahi Hawass, director of the Giza pyramids, has witnessed many openings of ancient tombs. The respected archaeologist has his own theory about the origin of a curse. If you close this room for 3,000 years, it will contain germs that you cannot see. Then if you open this room quickly and you enter, you will be beaten by these germs. And this is what happened to the Lord. And this is why I advise 
my colleagues all the time and tell them when we discover a tomb you have to open the door of the tomb for two days until the bad air will go out and the fresh air will go in and this is why uh, things happen perhaps if there was a curse its effect was more subtly felt for with the death of Lord Carnarvon Howard Carter lost more than a friend when Carnarvon died the bottom in effect fell out of Carter's world he was a very important man socially uh, and even politically uh, at that time and carried a lot of what you might call clout Carter was really on his own. Annoyed at the constant interruptions of government officials, Carter restricted visitors to the tomb. Tensions grew between the British archaeologist and the Antiquities Service over control of the excavation. Egypt had been ruled by foreigners since 320 BC, and now an angry nationalist party chose to flex its muscles. It's a whole political situation, and Carter was the least good person to handle matters of this kind. He was not good negotiating with officials. When the National Minister of Public Works, Marcos Bejana, argued with the archaeologist over visitation rights, an incensed Carter closed down the tomb leaving the sarcophagus lid still tenuously hanging above the coffin. Carter was a great archaeologist, but also was a very strange man. He did many mistakes. One of his biggest mistakes, in my opinion, was that he thought that this is his tomb. It's not, it was not his tomb. It was a tomb belonged to Egypt. Carter unwittingly played right into the Egyptians' hands. The Antiquities Service took control of the tomb and promptly changed the locks. When they hear that Carter was stopped in working in the tombs, the people in Cairo were very happy. And even they said, Viva Morcos Hanna, the minister of King Tut. A year passed before a humbled Carter was allowed to return and only after making serious concessions. The Carnarvon estate abandoned any formal claim to the treasures, and Carter himself agreed to work under the rules handed down by the government. In October of 1925, Carter finally removed the lid of the outer coffin, only to find another one nested inside. And then another, this one over six feet long and crafted of solid gold. Inside this coffin lay the mummy of Tutankhamun, crowned by a beautiful death mask. Fashioned by hand out of beaten gold and inlaid with colored glass and semi-precious stones, the solemn aspect of the young king left Carter speechless. He expresses his surprise and his wonder at it. Within the wrappings, they found a, a remarkable collection of jewelry, all, of course, heavily symbolic, uh, containing divine elements. There were well over a hundred pieces. Hot knives were used to separate the face mask from the skull. At last, the Englishman gazed upon the shriveled features of the king. I was speechless. I found myself traveling 3,000 years to the time when the young, vibrant king still lived. In November of 1925, Doctors and archaeologists gathered to begin the autopsy of the body of King Tut. The remains were in pitiful condition due to some sort of chemical combustion that had reduced some of its wrappings to soot. The skin was, for the most part, poorly preserved, leaving it brittle and cracked. The king's fingers and toes had been individually wrapped, 
and his folded arms concealed a three and a half inch embalming wound on the left side of his abdomen. Studies of the bone structure led experts to speculate the king had been approximately 18 years old when he died. If true, he would have been a mere child of eight or nine when he took the throne. This fact raised some interesting questions. How much did his advisors have to listen to him? Could they tell him to shut up and, 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 and stop being silly? Or now that he was invested as king and had this divine aspect, could he have some sort of say? And how had this boy king died? In 1968, scientific examinations revealed a curious small bone fragment within the skull. Was this merely a remnant of the embalming process or evidence of a mortal head wound? Many wondered if he had been wounded in battle or even murdered. It is very tempting to say, here the king was growing up, coming to an age where he could make his own decisions, where he didn't need his advisors anymore, and maybe uh, there were certain factions who didn't want to give up power, and therefore it was easier to, to bump the king off. Some point the finger at Tut's aging advisor, I, as the murderous villain. After all, it was he who ascended the throne upon the young pharaoh's death. Others incriminate the popular commander-in-chief of the army, General Horemheb. One expert suggests the true evidence lay in a letter written by Tut's desperate widow, begging Egypt's mortal enemy, the Hittites, to send her a royal prince to marry. After he died, she does not want to marry anyone in Egypt. She does not trust anyone, maybe because she knows what's happened. If he was not murdered, she will never ask for a foreign king to come and marry her. And this is why I believe that the reason that she knew about the assassination of King Tut, she does not want to have anything to do with I or Hormheb. Eventually, the advisor I married the young widow, but he ruled as pharaoh for only a few years. Upon his death, the general Horemheb assumed the crown and began to rebuild the Egyptian empire. When Horemheb finally becomes king, he takes the credit for most of what Tutankhamun had done. He, uh, he erases his name on most of the inscriptions and replaces them with his own. It's basically effectively saying, I was the one calling the shots when this kid was on the throne, so I deserve to get the credit. Some scholars disagree completely with this scenario, which depends too much on the mummy's age. The age was based on the analysis of the mummy um, and how bones knit together and so forth. Uh, in, in fact, it turns out that there's a kind of a, of a 10 year fudge factor um, in this because people develop more slowly in parts of the world and, and faster in others. Tutankhamun could have been uh, as old as 27 when he died, which means he could have come to the throne at 17 instead of nine. Had Tut been the force who had orchestrated Egypt's move away from the heresy of Akhenaten? Perhaps this explains why his tomb was so wealthy when he was only a minor king. What Tutankhamun did was symbolically so important that when they buried him, they gave him an especially fancy send-off. They provide burial equipment that, even by the standards of the earlier 18th dynasty, is exceptionally rich. So that might represent the gods' golden handshake, shall we say, for uh, a job well done. Howard Carter devoted more than a decade of his life to the clearance of the tomb and conservation of its artifacts yet he never completed the definitive publication of his findings. In 1939, at the age of 68, he succumbed to cancer, passing away in relative obscurity. I think Carter died a very sad, perhaps even disillusioned man. He had made one of the greatest archaeological discoveries, if not the greatest that had ever been made. But it became a burden to him. You do not get the feeling that um, when he trudged from his house 
to the tomb to work every day, that he went with a light heart. Ultimately, Carter's legacy lies in the very meticulousness of his craft. The more than 5,000 artifacts he cleared from Tutankhamun's tomb draw many hundreds of thousands to the Cairo Museum every year. What really we should give Carter a good credit that he insisted that he would find the tomb. Archaeology is not Raiders of the Lost Ark. It is not Indiana Jones who will look for treasures like that. But if you are a good archaeologist, you have to be patient. And this is what Carter did. Perhaps the ultimate irony is that out of all these treasures, there are still so many questions left unanswered. For now, Tutankhamun's life is still hidden. Howard Carter once said of him, the shadows move, but the dark is never quite uplifted. The mummy of Tutankhamun remains in his original burial chamber, the gilded coffin the one remaining splendor in his stripped-down tomb. He is the only great king of Egypt known to still rest in the Valley of the Kings. Insignificant in life, forgotten for so long in death, King Tut now rules over the imaginations of millions as another example of the wonders that await us whenever we go in search of history.